continue to launch the final talk uh, discussing the seller population of CDPs. All right, thanks, Mike. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Viraj Pandya. I'm a second year grad student here at UC Santa Cruz. And I want to tell you about some work that I've been doing on the observational side to study the stellar populations of ultra diffuse galaxies. This is work done with Aaron Romanowski and Gene Brody here at UCSC, Seppo Lane at Caltech, and Ben Johnson at Harvard. So, you've already heard from many of the previous talks that UDGs are extremely faint. They have mean surface brightnesses within their effective radii of ranging from 25 to 28 magnitudes per square arc second in the optical. And so spectroscopy, spectroscopy is, is extremely challenging, even, even with Keck. Uh, but we still want to know how old these systems are. Specifically, we want to know, we want to get constraints in their stellar populations. And so the current state of the art in the UDG literature and the observations is to speculate about ages and metallicities using uh, a single or perhaps two uh, colors which generally have a limited wavelength baseline, for example, G minus I or G minus R. And this goes back to the original paper by Peter Van Dockum in 2015, where he defined and discovered, or they discovered and defined UDGs. So you can see here, uh, they, they talk about uh, how the average G minus I color of their sample of UDGs can be reproduced by an old stellar population, seven giga years old and um, metal poor, but also a a relatively younger uh, stellar population with a relatively higher but still subsolar metallicity. And so just this year, a few months ago, there was this really cool paper by Rom Roman and Trujillo where they studied uh, their sample, the colors of their sample of classical red UDGs uh, using, they basically did the same thing, um, comparing not just one color but two colors, G minus R and G minus I, uh, to uh, single uh, SSPs. And they basically recovered the classical age metal metallicity de degeneracy. So in, in the sense that a single combination of G minus R and G minus I color could be reproduced by a range of ages and metallicity. So you could have the same color reproduced by an old stellar population that's metal poor, but also with progressively younger stellar populations that also get progressively more metal rich, but still subsolar metallicity, but extending all, all the way up. Now, of course, in reality, things are more complicated. So as far as I'm aware in the literature, most of these studies have been comparing their, their photometric constraints uh, to uh, SSPs, single SSPs, which might be okay for some globular clusters, but UDGs are, of course, galaxies, and they might have more complicated extended star formation histories. So we should be more agnostic about what the formulation of their star formation history actually is. The other thing is that there's been a lot of talk about the age metallicity de degeneracy, but in reality, as many of us know from, for example, our, our high redshift work, is that it's actually a three-way degeneracy. So it's age, metallicity, and dust. And you have to take into account dust, even if you don't want to, to uh, get a better handle on, on how that might impact your, your, your results on the ages and metallicities. And so we thought of two ways to help move the field forward in, the, in this respect. First. Uh, we are extending the wavelength range of the SEDs to the near infrared using brand new Spitzer IRAC photometry. And because there are claims in the literature that combining optical and near infrared photometry might help you break to some extent the age metallicity degeneracy. And the second thing we're going to do is we do full Bayesian MCMC based SED fitting because we're forced to be very explicit about what we simply do not know about UDGs. And we recover the full posteriors of our free parameters marginalized over our uncertainties in the model parameters. And so before I get into the sample and data and results, I want to quickly just say a few things about our tool. So we use a really powerful new uh, full Bayesian MCMC-based SED fitter called Prospector. I don't have time to go into the details, but I'm just going to say that the backbone of Prospector is Charlie Conroy's flexible stellar population synthesis code. Um, <clears throat> there's more details in Joel Leha's 2017 paper, and the code itself is public and available on GitHub. Uh, a couple things about our model assumptions. So um, we assume for simplicity, uh, because I can't do anything better with SEDs, is, uh, that the starfish issues are parameterized exp exponential declining tau models. This may not be correct, and I personally will not defend this, this formulation, but it is a good first step as opposed to assuming SSPs. We also assume a calcetic dust attenuation curve. We don't really find any changes uh, in our results if we instead assume an SMC attenuation curve or a Milky Way attenuation curve, both of which take into account either uh, the dust attenuation curve being having a, a steeper slope or that there's this uh, near UV uh, silicon absorption feature in the Milky Way absorption curve. 
we assume a Chabri IMF that could also, of course, in principle be, be off, but I'm not even going to try to go there. Um, and we have many other things in the model that, that are included, for example, nebular emission lines from Nell Byler's work, an AGB dust model from Alexa Viom's work, and a couple other things, uh, which I won't go into detail here. We're going to fit for five free parameters, and I'm going to assume a uniform prior for every single one of them because I am uninformed, as is everyone else, basically. I don't know what these things should be, so I'm not going to take a stab at that. The five free parameters are stellar mass, stellar metallicity, the E-folding time scale, or the tau parameter for the star efficient history, the age, which is basically the time since the Big Bang when star formation first started, and finally, the, norm the normalization of the attenuation curve. All right, so, so far we have two UDGs in our sample. On the left here, I'm showing a field UDG, DGSAT1, for which we have archival Subaru V and I band data, uh, shown on the top row, and we have brand new Spitzer IRAC1 and IRAC2 data. And then on the right, I'm showing our other UDG in the sample, which is a Virgo cluster UDG, VCC1287, for which we have archival CFHT U, G, I, and Z band data, as well as brand new IRAC1 data and archival IRAC2 data. One thing you might ask, and this is the first thing I did, is does UV data exist for these things? Does mid-infrared data exist? Does far-infrared data exist? And I went to the archive for, for HST, Galax, WISE, uh, Spitzer, Herschel, and either the data does not exist, or if it does exist, I downloaded it, derived upper limits, and the upper limits are four magnitudes brighter than my actual measurements in these bands that are basically useless. But that's where we are right now in the UDG field. Uh, very quickly, I want to mention that we do our photometry using the same circular aperture in every band pass because we care about measuring the color self consistently. Our masses will be off by a factor of two at most, about 0.3 dex. Uh, the size of the aperture is chosen to be the half light radius from the literature. Uh, we're very careful about masking out contaminants from the foreground and background, especially in the IRAC bands, and propagating systematic uncertainties onto our magnitude error bars. And after you do the actual math and do the single noise calculations, uh, I was surprised to find, but both UDGs, both UDGs are significantly de detected in all band passes shown here, including the one on the right in IRAC2, which you barely can make out. All right, so we ran our photometry, photometry through Prospector, and so we can compare our observed photometry to, to the SEDs, and this is what they look like. Uh, the SED fits are reasonable, as you can see, uh, and the shapes of the SEDs basically suggest old star populations, but of course, what, do we, what can we say about the the dust and age, uh, the dust age metallicity degeneracy in more detail. So here I'm showing some marginalized posterior. So on the bottom, the first row is for DGSAT1, the second row is for VCC1287, and from left to right, the columns are stellar mass, stellar metallicity, the E folding time scale, the age, and the normalization of the attenuation curve. Uh, and the first thing I want to point out is that in every, in every sub panel, the, the gray line is just shown to mimic uh, uniform prior, and there seems to be some constraining power in the, in the data. Uh, the posteriors are not the uniform priors. Uh, and just to sum it up very quickly, both UDGs appear to be very old. They have subsolar metallicity with the field UDG having marginally uh, higher metallicity. That could, that could be a data limitation problem. And both UDGs, when you take the ratio of the age to the tau parameter, they have, uh, have gone, undergone several E foldings, uh, E folds in their star efficient history with marginal evidence that the field UDG might have a more, a slightly more extended star formation history, but I wouldn't bet my career on that. Uh, you can also look at the covariance plots. So this is for DGSAT1. We have more limited data. These are noisy plots because we don't have data blue word of the V-band, so we don't have a data basically blue word of the 4,000 angstrom break to anchor it down. Uh, one thing I'm going to point out, though, is that there is this, on the bottom here, there is this uh, intuitive degeneracy between dust and metallicity, which we recover, even though the dust only goes up to about 0.5 magnitudes of, uh, of extinction at most. Um, if you have more dust, you need, you need a lower metallicity to reproduce the same color, of course, marginalized over the ages. Same thing for VCC 1287, smoother contours because we go down to beyond blue word of the 4,000 angstrom break. Uh, one thing I'll point out is that the metallicity is actually an upper limit. The prospector libraries don't go below uh, log of metallicity below minus two. Um, so it might even, this object might be even more metal poor. Uh, so one thing we can do now with these constraints, if you believe the metallicities, is to place these two objects uh, in context um, with the mass metallicity relation for stars. So we've done that here for a bunch of dwarfs and massive galaxies. Uh, and so DGSAT1 appears to be consistent with the stellar mass metallicity relation, whereas VC1287 seems to be a bit below it. And so the implications of this are still unclear, but we're working on that now. And so I want to conclude by just uh, 
recapping that we did full Bayesian MCMC based SCD fitting of these two UDGs. We have a couple more UDGs that we're working on. Uh, two famous ones in the coma cluster, DF44 and DF17, and some of these so-called blue UDGs. Um, <clears throat> both the UDGs, UDGs that we've looked so far are, are old, metal poor, and relatively dust free, even though one of them is in the field and one of them is in a cluster. And the field UDG is consistent with the mass metallicity relationship, uh, whereas the cluster UDG is below it. And so one important next step is going to be to compare our ages and metallicities to what uh, theory predicts, simulations predict, uh, to try to test out different UDG formation scenarios for clusters versus the field. Uh, but one thing I want to point out and stress myself is that there have been many assumptions that went into this SED fitting process as, as goes into any SED fitting process. And so I personally also want to explore systematic uncertainties and you know, derived quantities and how to, how to tackle this better in the future because it's a very hard problem as I hope I've convinced you and spectroscopy is uh, very hard to do even uh, with Keck, 20 hours on Keck, for example. So thank you very much. Uh, I completely agree with you. I mentioned I'm not going to defend tau models, uh, but you know we have very limited data for SEDs just because that's the way it is for UDGs. Um, you can say you can probably say that that the assumption of a of a, of a tau model basically drives our results. One thing though is that we leave tau as a free parameter, so you know we allow for the for the possibility that these things could have been SSPs. They might be. We're not really sure. One thing we cannot do with SED fitting is to uh, allow for multiple bursts of star formation. There's no way you can constrain that with the data. If you had spectra, you should derive non-parametric star formation histories, but in different age bins. But I don't know how far away that is. Maybe a couple years. So, uh, but I completely agree with you, David. Yes. Yes, I've done that for both of the UDGs that I showed in multiple radial bins, uh, and there's no significant dif differences in the resulting corner plots and marginalized posteriors, which is interesting in and of itself. It suggests that the UDGs are a well mixed population, so, or for these two at least.